well, I can actually, it's now 7.01. I see some people are still joining in. Um, but I'll go ahead and start um, with the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here tonight. I'm Regina Jorgensen. I'm the Director of Astronomy here at the Mariah Mitchell Association. And um, I'd first actually like to start out by thanking our sponsors for the Science Speaker Series, um, AC Climate, Nantucket Island Resorts, and the Ocelio Foundation. And we thank them a lot for their um, support of this series. I'll also put in a plug here for our uh, next week speaker, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. We're going to be hosting um, Dr. JJ Hermes, who's a professor of astrophysics at Boston University and one of our affiliated astronomers this summer. And he's going to be giving a talk entitled, When the Referee Lets You Name Your Stars. So I'd encourage you to tune into the next astronomy talk as well. Um, I'll just go through um, a really quick uh, logistical introduction. Um, if you have questions um, during the talk, I would encourage you to use the Q&A function, which you should see either at the top or the bottom of your screen depending on your Zoom setup. Um, and it allows you to actually type a question in um, and then we'll answer them at the end of Jay's talk. Um, and additionally, if you'd like to actually ask your question in person, um, at the end, once Jay has finished, uh, you can use the raise your hand feature and we'll take questions that way. And you can actually, uh, we can unmute you so you can actually ask your question if you prefer to do that. Um, so with that, um, I couldn't be more excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, this is the MMO's own research fellow, Jay Chidity. Um, Jay first came to the MMO as a, a National Science Foundation REU, or Research Experience for Undergraduates student in the summer of 2018. I distinctly remember discussing with him, as I do with many students, uh, his past experiences and his plans for the future. And I was really surprised to learn that Jay had not entered college with dreams of becoming an astronomer or any kind of STEM practitioner. And in fact, he was interested in politics. Um, and it was apparently a chance encounter with an enthralling intro to astronomy class taught by Deborah Elmagreen at Vassar that really won Jay over. Um, and for this chance coincidence, I, and I think you'll all see soon, the field of astrophysics will be forever grateful. Um, in just a few short years, Jay has shown himself to have an enormous amount of passion and a great natural talent for astrophysics. In fact, in just the past two or three years, he's worked in three completely different fields of astrophysics and produced amazing results in all of them. As an REU student at the MMO, Jay worked along with Dr. Phil Muirhead at Boston University to identify cool dwarf stars using the Gaia satellite in order to improve future observations of TESS, a planet finding mission. Um, he completed his senior thesis at Vassar College under the supervision of Professor Colette Salik, um, in which he analyzed light from carbon monoxide in the disk around a young star suspected of hosting a hot Jupiter type planet. And his results called into question the existence of that planet. And now, as the MMO's first research fellow, Jay has joined the Fast and Fortunate for FRB follow-up team, also called F4. And he's recently submitted a first author publication on his results using fast radio bursts to study the cosmic web, which is gonna be the topic of his talk tonight. Jay graduated with departmental honors from Vassar College in May of 2019 and joined us here um, back at the Mariah Mitchell Association um, to become the first research fellow in September of 2019. Uh, while here, in addition to his research, Jay has been assisting in day-to-day -day functioning of the observatory, and this summer he's actually co-advising one of our current REU students. In a few months, Jay will be leaving Nantucket to begin his PhD program in astrophysics at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I, for one, cannot wait to see what field of astrophysics Jay decides to tackle next. Jay is a highly valued colleague and collaborator from whom I learn something new every day. And I know that the F4 team would agree that Jay's work this year has been crucial to our entire collaboration success. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Jay Chidity, who will be giving a talk entitled Strange Signals and a Cosmic Conundrum Using Fast Radio Bursts to Uncover the Universe's Hidden Matter. Thank you so much, Regina, for the very kind introduction. And I will just say that I definitely wouldn't be here today without the help and support 
and wonderful advice that you've provided me for the past few years. So thank you so much, Regina. Um, thank you all for joining me, uh, joining all of us here at this talk today. And I'm really excited to share some of the awesome results that we've published and to be published soon that we've worked on for the past uh, year. Um, so thank you. Oops. I'll just start by saying two summers ago, as Regina had mentioned, I was an REU intern here at Nantucket. Um, and this past year, I have definitely met, missed all of my wonderful REU uh, cohort members, Annie, PJ, Katie, Alex, and Kaylee. Um, it's not the same uh, without having them here in person. But it has been an incredible year for me, and I'm excited to share some of the results that we have. So a quick inter overview. I am not a cosmology uh, cosmologist. I'm more towards the field of galactic astronomy and planetary science. But even then, I don't have a degree yet in a PhD specifically. So I'm going to give you a quick a bad astronomer's overview of cosmology. We're going to talk about what the universe is made of and what I mean when I say the phrase hidden matter. That's going to tie into how we have solved that problem using the story of fast radio bursts. And I'll cover about how they've been discovered, what they are, and how, again, we're going to use them to solve this other problem. And I'll also go over what's next for the field of fast radio bursts, specifically in the work that we do here. So hang in there with me. This is sort of a jargony, uh, a jargony talk, but I think I'm going to be able to try to walk you through some of that. On the right here, I'm showing a, a, a sort of a plot of our universe over time uh, with the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, on the left and the modern day universe all the way on the right. Our universe is made of three simple ingredients. Uh, they're actually not so simple. They're super complicated. And I wish anyone who's trying to make their own universe uh, the best of luck. But those three simple ingredients are something called baryonic matter. That's matter like you and me here on our Earth. Um, the Earth, the Sun, galaxies, things we can see are, are baryonic matter. There's something called dark matter, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, that is definitely not like us. But like baryonic matter, it, it, has, it, it has gravity. And so it has a lot of consequences in our universe. There's also a third ingredient that you might have heard of before called dark energy. Um, it's responsible for the rapid acceleration of our universe, especially in the current day. Um, and I honestly don't know much about dark energy. Um, someone else in the audience might. So I will not be talking that much about dark energy or dark matter for that, uh, for that, for that point. Um, so you might want to ask how much baryonic matter is there compared to dark matter, to dark energy in our universe? And the question stems, the question can be answered first from a theoretical point of view. There's something called the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. In the very first moments, something like first 30 seconds of our universe, um, thir first 30 seconds of the next hundred, couple hundred thousand years, um, the universe created certain, uh, had protons and neutrons that would form the basis of hydrogen and helium and all the wonderful elements that we'd have much later on in the universe. But the question of how much baryonic matter that we would expect um, first was answered in part by studying something called quasars. Regina Jorgensen, uh, Regina here, she's the expert on quasars. And when we, quasars are these really far away um, energetic sources, far, far in the universe. Um, and they, sh they act as a flashlight through everything in between. And what they allows us to do is that allows us to probe something called deuterium, that's the D there. Uh, the D slash H is a ratio of deuterium to hydrogen. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, but that deuterium decreases with time across the universe. What that means is stars, as they're the engines of our modern day universe pumping out new elements, they actually eat up more deuterium than hydrogen. So the primordial deuterium, the, prim the deuterium that was formed at the beginning of our universe, um, quasars are helping identify how much deuterium there was earlier on, on in the universe versus now. And what we can do is when we compare the ratio of deuterium we see then, um, back in, in the history of the universe to now, and the hydrogen now and before, we actually are able to understand how much, how much baryonic matter, how much matter like you and me there originally was. There's a second ingredient to answering that question. Oh, whoops. Um, there was a probe released by NASA and Planck, uh, excuse me, NASA called WMAP and then ESA, 
which is a European space agency called Planck, and they both studied something called the cosmic microwave background light. You might have heard of this as well in the news. Uh, we sort of abbreviate that as CMB. This is the light um, in the figure that I'm showing here on the right, the afterglow light pattern at around 375,000 years. That is the light that the cosmic microwave background is. Um, it's from the, one of the earliest moments in our universe that um, we can understand. That gives us the second um, clue to how much baryonic matter that we can expect. So on the right here is a very famous plot from the Planck collaboration. Um, all the little dark reds and uh, blues you see are highlighting slight variations in the temperature of that light. So light has a temperature and this, the cosmic background background is emitting in the microwave wavelength. So let's think of what your own microwave would emit. It's, we can't see it with our eyes, but uh, wonderful instruments like Planck and WMAP were able to observe it. That light, again, was, is probing when atoms first formed at around the 375,000 years after the Big Bang mark, um, when light could finally travel freely in our universe. Um, and slight variations in the cosmic microwave temperature, cosmic microwave background temperature, excuse me, is actually revealing what present day densities, uh, variations in densities um, in the present day universe. So they're highlighting where mass is today, uh, or predicting in a way, um, what the future distribution of mass would be like. When we put these two together, we get, we get an idea of how much baryonic matter there is. And it turns out only 5% of what's called the matter and energy content of our universe, there's matter like you and me, and there's energy in the form of photons and light. Um, all of that, all of our universe can sort of be simplified down to these three things. And it turns out dark energy is about 70% of that. Dark matter is about 25% of that. And matter like us is only 5% of our universe. Um, we can do a second thing and say, how much baryon, how many baryons do we actually see in our universe? How many can we observe? Uh, this 5% is from theory. That's uh, sort of from theory. We expect to see 5%. How much do we actually see? We can look at galaxies and um, calculate how much light and, and assume, and excuse me, we can infer a mass from the amount of light uh, that we see in galaxies. We can extrapolate that out to large distances and see, okay, well, we observe how many baryons. Turns out we only see about half of the baryons that we had expected. Um, astronomers in the audience might disagree with my characterization of half. Some people say we only saw 10%, some people say half percent, or excuse me, 50%. But the, by and large, the point is that there's a portion of the matter in our universe, the baryonic matter, let me correct myself, that we don't see uh, from light. And that's actually, and we, we have theories about where it might be, but the fact that we don't see it has made this an interesting problem in astronomy to solve. So where is that missing matter? We think that it's in the halos of galaxies where the dark matter dominates. So on the right here, I have a figure. It's short of showing you a schematic of what a typical galaxy might look like, specifically in the modern day. There's a disk where, there's a thin and thick disk where stars and gas and um, most of the stuff that we can think of that we regularly uh, might imagine as a galaxy is. There's a central part called a bulge. And around that disk and bulge, there is a, a diffuse medium called a halo. This halo extends way, way, way further out than any light that we can see, partly because of this dark matter. Dark matter has gravity. And so because there is so much dark matter in our universe, remember 25% versus 5%, um, dark matter dominates as you go further out from one galaxy. What we think is happening is that hot and warm gas is ejected from the stars uh, and um, other phenomena in our disk. And that hot gas ends up residing in the halo and it becomes very diffuse. In other words, that means the density is very, very, very low. And because of the, it's very hot and it's very, very, it's very low density, we can't see it in emission. That means it doesn't emit light. Um, gas also exists in streams connecting galaxies. So now we're zooming out again and we're thinking on a little bit bigger picture. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. This is called the cosmic web. Um, it's a giant web of matter and dark matter, really, um, that's connecting galaxies. And we think some of those missing baryons, that missing matter, is also there. Here's an image of a simulation 
uh, something called the Millennium Sil Simulation is showing a very, very large scale structure of our universe in this cosmic web. So cosmology is predicting that there's more baryonic matter, this matter like you and me, than we can see. And we think right now that it's in the cosmic web and it's in this hot gas and the halos and between galaxies. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to save that bit in your mind. I'm gonna take a complete 180 and I'm gonna talk about something different, which is these fast radio bursts. So 2007, there's something called the Lorimer burst. Uh, I have pictured here, uh, Duncan Lorimer and Maura McLaughlin. They were both two um, scientists that were hired at, at the University of West Virginia University in 2007. They're both radio astronomers. So radios like we have on our phones, uh, not our phones, uh, in our cars, really. Um, that's actually a kind of light that we can see in an astro uh, that astronomers observe, um, except we've ve been very clever to repurpose it for communications here on Earth. So Duncan Lorimer and Mara McLaughlin, they're radio astronomers. They look at the universe in radio light. And they were looking at something called the Parkes Telescope. That's this wonderful, huge 60 plus meter um, telescope dish radio dish, um, to study something called pulsars. These are a very unique kind of star in our universe. And what they found while they were observing, looking at these pulsars, was they found a signal, some burst, that lasted for only five milliseconds. That's kind of amazing, um, because this, this object had so much, it was so bright, it was one of the brightest things that they had seen, and it only lasted for five milliseconds. So five milliseconds is about five thousandths a second, I think. I hope I did that right. So they're really curious, was it just a fluke of the instrument? Was this some crazy other phenomena? So they observed in that same area for about 90 more hours, but they didn't find anything. So I'm going to break down what that signal looked like and why and how it became the, the prototypical fast radio burst. Here's one of the mother, one of the other crazy things that they had discovered in that signal is that here is a, on the picture right here, I have the intensity, which is the brightness of the signal over time. That's in milliseconds. And it starts at zero seconds in about 500 seconds. So it's about half a second long. That's what's showing in this, uh, that's what's shown in this inset right here. And you can see that really sharp peak. That's the, that's the Lorimer burst. And what they found was that the light arrived, um, higher frequencies arrived earlier at the telescope than lower frequencies. What that means is that Brighter, you can think of more blue light. Um, blue light and red light arrived. There was a time delay between uh, when they arrived at the Parkes telescope. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, here's another plot that's showing that same thing. This is called dispersion. You can see that this um, black line, this sort of curved line, what it's showing is that, again, these higher frequencies are arriving at the Parkes telescope at earlier times than the lower frequencies. If there was no dispersion, that's what this effect is showing, it would just be this black bar right here. They would all arrive at the same time. I'm gonna do that one more time. This is with dispersion. This, is, this black bar shows what would happen if there was no dispersion. So what is dispersion really? It, it's a way to relate electron density and distance. So dispersion measure, that's, what's, that's a way to quantify this effect, uh, relates electron density and distance. Electrons are baryons, like you and me and most of the other things that we interact with um, on a daily basis. Um, so they give us a way to probe this. The only thing that could cause this effect are baryons. But the dispersion measure for this object was too high. It was too high to be reasonably pointing to anything in our own galaxy. In fact, the dispersion measure was so high that they looked back at their cosmology and they said, what would if we assume that this is coming from some far away object, how far away would it be if we assume a uh, density in the cosmic web that we know from theory? And they, they realized it had to be something so like 3 billion light years away. That means that it's probably extra galactic. That means it's coming from outside of our own galaxy. So one more time, higher dispersion um, typically would mean either there's more electrons between you and whatever is causing this, this burst and or it's at a really far distance. How far is 3 billion light years, you might ask? This is not to scale. I just want to give you an idea. Uh, I have Earth here on the left and the sun. Light takes about eight minutes to arrive 
from the sun to here on earth. That's about 93 million miles away. 93 million miles is a lot. I can't even imagine that. Um, but it takes light only eight minutes to travel that far. The nearest galaxy, um, if you're lucky, come to, come to Loins. Uh, I don't think now is a great time to see Andromeda, but uh, definitely in, the, in other seasons, it's, it's very visible and we'll be able to show you the Andromeda galaxy. It's our nearest galaxy. It's in fact the only extra galactic object you can see in the Northern Hemisphere. It's 2.5 million light years away. Remember the sun was eight light minutes away. And the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half light years away. Um, and at our fastest speed, it, it would take us something like 10 billion years to reach the Andromeda galaxy. What's funny is actually the Andromeda galaxy is getting closer to us with time. And if you got in a spacecraft and somehow managed to shoot yourself off to the Andromeda galaxy, Andromeda would reach us sooner than you would be able to reach Andromeda. So it's a funny little fact. So Lorimer burst happened some 1,200 times further than the Andromeda galaxy is to us. It's kind of, it's kind of shocking in a way. What does that affect the dispersion sound like? Um, if you have a pet who is really sensitive to noise, or perhaps you are, I apologize. Um, this is a audio. Uh, we've converted the radio wavelength difference to sound. It might help understand dispersion a little bit better. Higher frequencies first, and then lower frequencies later. I'll do that one more time. And just one more time, just to annoy you. I'm sort of spoiling the surprise of fast radio bursts, but this is in fact a separate fast radio burst. This is not the Lorimer burst. This is a different fast radio burst um, called 121102. And I'll talk about that one a little bit more in a few minutes. Cool. So Duncan Lorimer, um, there was only one fast, one burst like it, uh, and that was Lorimer's burst. And there was really no other object like it detected for many years. And in fact, at that point, astronomers were, were saying, maybe this is not some real astrophysical object. It's probably just something else. Um, it's probably some fluke of the instrument. There's something here on Earth that's causing it. And for many years, Lorimer was one of the few people who was insistent that this was something real. This was some phenomena that was happening outside of our galaxy. Um, and what's funny is just in 2012, this is five years after the Lorimer burst, Moira McLaughlin, this is Duncan Lorimer's wife, remember, um, she published, uh, she helped publish a paper where with the Parkes telescope, they discovered other signals that are pictured here on the, on the left here that have dispersion that were not another known astrophysical object. And what they showed was this, uh, whatever was causing these signals here on the left were almost certainly coming from Earth. And they called this phenomena, called, they called it peritons. This is a famous Jorge Luis Borges novel. Uh, someone in the audience might be familiar with it. They look something like this. Um, they both have this, this, this the Dormer burst and these peritons have dispersed signals. So they, they, they at first, you might say that they, they might be the same thing. But there's one key difference that was still helping Lorimer's case. And it's a sort of technical part about how a radio telescope works. Here is, I've manufactured what the Parkes telescope, how it looks. You can imagine each of these circles is its own telescope. And um, what's convenient is I have a little background of stars. You can imagine that each of those little circles is looking at a different field. And they're all sort of honeycombed together like this. The paratons, they detected the burst from the paratons in every single, all 13 of the parks, um, at the parks beams, these are called beams. So you can say that they just detected them in all 13 of those small little telescopes. Um, usually what happens is something from Earth would be able to cause that. The Lorimer burst only happened on three. That would be consistent with something that's happening outside of our, um, outside of our, um, outside of the Earth. So they were non-terrestrial. Paratons were terrestrial, uh, almost certainly were terrestrial. But the Lorimer burst, there was still hope that it was not terrestrial because it wasn't, it wasn't seen on all of the beams. It, it couldn't have been 
it, it didn't necessarily have to be something from Earth. The good news is, in fact, in 2012, after Mark McLaughlin had published the paper, the Arecibo Array, you might have seen it in GoldenEye or other films here on the, on the right. Uh, it's a wonderful revolutionary telescope in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, Arecibo detected another fast radio burst. I and mean, in fact, this one would repeat. That was what was really exciting. Instead of just one burst, it happened many times. And that's why we call it the repeater. Um, and in fact, the repeater is, because it was able to repeat, we were able to point our telescopes at the same location and be able to track down exactly where it was coming from. What we found is this little tiny galaxy, three billion light years away. It's not the same galaxy as, or it's not the same source as the Lorimer burst. This is a different galaxy. It just also happens to be three billion light years away. Um, and that was a terrific discovery because now we had a location for where one of these fast radio bursts were coming from. Here's another thing that we were able to learn with that. If you take the observed brightness, so whatever brightness the telescope detected, and you know the distance, in this case, um, this optical image that I'm showing here shows a dwarf galaxy that is host to FRB 121102. And if you know the distance, which is 3 billion light years, with, with a little bit of easy math, you can figure out how much energy the fast radio burst had emitted. And what turned out is that in those five milliseconds or so, this burst had about as much energy as the sun emits in all wavelengths in 24 hours. So all the energy our big, beautiful sun emits in 24 hours, a fast radio burst is able to emit in five milliseconds. This makes it one of the most energetic events that we know of in the modern day universe. Oh, and about those paratons, it turned out they were a microwave. This is real. So at the Parkes telescope, it turned out that right around lunchtime, whenever an astronomer would open their microwave too early, before the cycle was finished, before it was finished heating, there'd be a, a few milliseconds where part of the microwave, the part that actually generates the signal, the, the microwaves, it doesn't turn off. It's called, I think it's called a mag magnetron. And for those few milliseconds, if the Parkes telescope is active, it will detect a signal that looks just like a fast radio burst. So um, isn't that just like the most bizarre thing you've ever, ever heard? Like a microwave causing something, causing this much, this much confusion. But now we have detected many, 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 many more bursts. In fact, we've detected hundreds of fast radio bursts. Since the repeater, the one in 2012, there's a, an array called CHIME. That's the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Astronomers really love their acronyms. It's kind of it's a long-standing tradition. CHIME, uh, again, this Canadian experiment, uh, they repurposed and they reorganized how they uh, observed so they could specifically look for fast radio bursts. And in fact, they found eight new repeating fast radio bursts. And they're rumored to have detected hundreds of non-repeating fast radio bursts. And one of them was even in a spiral galaxy very close by. This is showing an image of that galaxy. You can see the spiral arms. This is, um, the reason a spiral galaxy is really cool is that that's actually kind of the galaxy that we're, uh, that's actually kind of galaxy the Milky Way, our own galactic home is like. So now we know that fast radio bursts can come from galaxies similar to our own. There's another radio telescope or radio array specifically that also searches for a fast radio burst. And it's actually the one that Regina and I work with. That's called ASCAP. That's the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder. The reason that ASCAP is also really good is that while chime can look all over the sky at the same time it has a bad it doesn't do a great job at figuring out specifically where a fast radio burst came from ascap can do that very very precisely um, what that means is that we can every time there is a fast radio burst we can quickly nail down which galaxy it came from um, in the next few years, we're expecting to find hundreds of more fast radio bursts. And in fact, we currently think that there's something like 10 FRBs that occur a minute. And just looking at the time in the past half hour, that means uh, 30 times 10, 300 fast radio bursts have gone off. We probably haven't detected them all, but um, it's kind of like a crazy, it's crazy to think how frequent these, these fast radio bursts are happening. So, I know many of you are sitting there like, Jay, you've been talking about what, you've been walking around this question 
but what are these fast radio bursts? What's causing them? Um, and I know many people in the media have hoped that it would be aliens. Um, many, many people have been hoping for aliens. In fact, so many people have been hoping for aliens, but I assure you it's not ancient aliens. It's not aliens nearby or far away. Um, definitely not that, I assure you, or 99% confident that it is not an alien trying to communicate with us. In fact, we think it's something else. We have about 50 theories until very recently about what FRBs could be. A lot of these um, involved the end stages of massive stars. So on the, on the right here, I've pictured a black hole, a neutron star, a white dwarf, and a supernova. These are all associated with the end stages of not all of the massive stars, like a white dwarf is what our own sun will become at the end of its life, but these very energetic and old, the remnants of stars. And a lot of our theories say, what if it's a black hole colliding with a neutron star or a white dwarf colliding with a neutron star? You can imagine there's a lot of energy that goes into um, an event like that. And that's partly why we think that they might be associated with that. Here's the challenge though. A good theory has to be able to explain our observations. So whatever combination of black holes and neutron stars you want to think of, they have to be able to explain repeaters, non-repeaters, and another property of fast radioers we've identified, which is the light coming from them can be really polarized. In fact, one of the most polarized astrophysical objects we've ever detected. Um, and it turns out it's probably not that easy. In fact, one theory probably can't explain all the different kinds of fast radio bursts out there. Um, so there might be many different kinds of objects that are causing these huge explosions that we see. Um, what I do is um, part of our collaboration, we're studying the host galaxies to see if there's clues as to what these fast radio bursts might be. But the field really blew up on April 20th, 28th, 2020. There's a really exciting discovery um, that you might have already heard about in the media, a galactic fast radio burst. So there's this object called SGR 1935 plus 2154. I'm not going to repeat that again. Um, it's something called a magnetar which is a kind of neutron star with a really powerful magnetic field. I'll quickly explain what a neutron star is. Sometimes when massive stars can't, um, when before, instead of becoming a black hole, they, they try to collapse and try to collapse and try to collapse, but then they explode and what's left over is all the pressure pushed the atoms apart. And then in, in effect, what's happening is the neutrons are all pressed together. Very, very dense objects. A neutron star um, causes all sorts of wonderful radio signals, and a magnetar is also known to have caused radio signals. But this is the first time that a magnetar has been observed causing a signal like a fast radio burst. Well, it's really, that's actually what's visualized here on the right, a magnetar. Um, the magnetic field of a magnetar is a thousand times more powerful than a neutron star. Altogether, what that means is the most powerful magnet on Earth can generate a magnetic field of a strength called one Tesla. I know it's sort of hard to think about, but um, we've actually done a really good job of creating powerful magnets. A magnetar has a powerful a magnetic field, the strength of um, something like a billion Tesla. So a billion times more powerful than any magnet we can, just, we can create on Earth. So this signal, again, I'm getting off track. <laughs> a galactic fast radio burst, right? This magnetar, Here's a plot of that signal from a paper that was just recently submitted. Uh, at the top two there, you might recall, we showed a similar intensity plot. Um, this is showing signal and noise, but it's similar to um, brightness. Um, it's related to brightness. And on the bottom, the, the x-axis is time in milliseconds, where the time since the burst is centered at the peak of the signal. And what I want to highlight is this feature on the right where it says XP2, about three milliseconds after, there was also an X-ray, uh, there was X-ray emission detected from this magnetar. What makes that really exciting is that if magnetars are common and they're the common source of fast radio bursts, then we might expect X-ray emission coming from other fast radio bursts in distant galaxies to be associated uh, again with the fast radio burst. And so now we're gonna be looking really carefully in the future um, more carefully than we already have about seeing if we can look at a fast radio burst at the same time with an X-ray telescope like Chandra or Exxon Newton and see if we can detect 
X-ray emission. It's going to be a real challenge, though. Uh, what's also exciting is that if this galactic magnetar was in a faraway galaxy, it was so bright here that we would have been able to detect it far, far away. So what does that mean? Um, we have one idea of what's causing these fast radio bursts. There are still some gaps that we need to fit, fill in, and there's still possibly totally other avenues for which what can cause fast radio bursts. Um, if you're really curious, there's a website called frbtheorycat.org. There's a website that highlights all the different theories, what you can predict, what sort of emission, other kinds of light you might expect to, from a fast radio burst if, this, if one of those theories is in fact an FRB um, for the curious-minded people in the audience tonight. Here's what I want you to take away from this section. Fast radio bursts, they're these short but powerful explosions. They're caused by magnetars and likely other extreme objects. Now I'm gonna pull it back to cosmology and I'm gonna to try to bring in why this fast radio burst is such a game changer for finding that missing matter. So whatever their origins are still useful for science. And I'm gonna play this quick video that's gonna explain dispersion one more time, just because I've gone off track and explained all the stuff about fast radio bursts and stuff. Um, I'm gonna talk about dispersion one last time. Um, here's a faraway galaxy, boom, an FRB goes off. And here you see the light. We're showing different frequencies with purple through red. Purple is a higher frequency light, or yes, and then the lower frequency light is a red. As it goes through matter between us and uh, the uh, host galaxy, as it's traveling through the missing matter, the wavelengths are getting further and further apart. Excuse me, the frequencies are getting further and further apart. There's a time delay. The more matter, the more dispersion until finally we detect it here on Earth. Here it is, the signal from the FRB reaching ASCAP. And there, you see the different color light representing different frequencies is arriving at different times. So, dispersion. I'm going to bring in what I do. Here's trying to bring it closer to what I do. Um, the dispersion measure, again, can tell us about how much baryonic light, or bar baryonic matter, that's matter like us, that the light has traveled through. So even though that, that invisible hot gas I've pictured here on the right, um, even though it's not itself emitting light that we can detect, when light travels through it, it, it it's dispersed. And I just remembered and one last analogy for dispersion. It's sort of like when, if you keep your head above water and you're in the pool or in the ocean, and if you look below water, it looks like your body sort of like went at a tilt and it looks like your head sounded disconnected. Um, that's a similar effect that dispersion is, uh, is causing. When it goes through a different medium, the light uh, travel time is different. There's something else that's also happening that's contributing to dispersion, but it's a, it's a good analogy to think of. Again, I've highlighted one more fact. Less invisible hot gas means smaller dispersion measure. The more invisible hot gas it's traveled through, the fast radio burst light has traveled through, the more dispersion measure. There's lots of challenges to this, to figure out how much of the invisible gas that the FRB has traveled through. And the biggest is, how much is that host galaxy, because there's gas and hot gas in that own host galaxy, how much of that host galaxy is contributing to dispersion measure? That's actually a really hard question to answer. That's actually what I did for my own research this past year. And what about the local environment of any given FRB? Is there hot gas that's right around the, the magnetar, let's say, that's causing the FRB? Those are things that are hard to figure out. But still, this offers a great way for us to start detecting that hidden matter in our universe. And in fact, we, um, our collaboration under the leadership of J.P. McQuart um, published, we have found essentially this missing matter. What JP um, was able to do is look at a bunch of fast radio bursts that ASCAP and other teams had detected. And what's plotted here on the right is the dispersion measure as a result of just the, just the missing matter versus the redshift on the x-axis. Redshift is, is an astronomer's way of measuring distance. Um, you can think of that as distance, as the further away you go, the, the larger distance um, you're encountering. It's nonlinear, which means 
going from point one to point two is not the same distance as going from point two to point three. Um, that's actually more distance. You cover more distance as you go up in redshift, but it's still a really um, useful way for us to think about that. Um, so this is a gold sample of fast radio bursts. And what we, what the, again, what they did to calculate that DM cosmic that's highlighted on the graph is they assumed, they, they did some good math and said, we expect that the Milky Way, our own galaxy, contributed a small amount to dispersion measure. We're gonna think a little bit about how much a host galaxy will, will contribute, and we're also gonna subtract that amount from the observed dispersion measure. And what will be left is whatever the, whatever the missing baryons are contributing. And that gray shaded region with the black line, it's highlighting what cosmology, remember cosmology predicted 5% of the universe is um, in baryons. Um, that sort of shows, the black line shows what our cosmology is telling us we should expect, how much baryons we should expect for distance. And then the shaded area is to cover any given variation along any given line of sight. Remember that Planck image I showed you? There was different, slightly different densities here and there. Uh, sort of to cover that. Um, that the idea that any given line of sight, you might detect a little bit more here versus any given missing baryons when you look at a different location. So what, is, what, did, what did JP's paper find? JP was found that, in fact, as the points are highlighting, there is exactly the amount of missing matter out there in the universe that FRBs were able to detect that our theory predicts. In other words, we have detected the, we have found that missing matter. Um, and it is actually a really momentous occasion, especially for our collaboration and using fast radio bursts. Um, and so JP published this paper um, along with all the other papers that I'm gonna talk about in a minute um, at the end of May. Um, and actually what's very tragic is that, um, here is JP here. JP passed away just a few weeks ago. Just it was a very tragic loss to the community. Um, JP led the efforts to study FRBs with the, um, in a collaboration we're calling CRAFT um, with the ASCAP array, um, a real leader in the field. And what was, and it's, it's a really sad moment for us in the, in the field, but in his honor, we've named that dispersion measure versus redshift relationship after him. We're calling it the MacQuart relationship. Um, in his honor. One of the last contributions uh, of JP, again, was this phenomenal paper that we're going to be citing for years and years to come. And we got a lot of media coverage, including interviews with JP, um, which are really special because those are some of the last moments that we have with him. Um, so many, um, the popular press really covered this, this news of finding the missing baryons well. And he was also in uh, CNN and some of our own work was in uh, these other um, other websites, and that was really cool to 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 have happen, and we were really fortunate about that. I'm going to highlight two of those six papers that we published. Um, here on the left, again, I've shown the the important plot from the real one of the most important plots from JP's paper. I'm going to highlight one point, that red point right there, that's from the fast radio burst 190608, and you might notice it's sort of riding the line riding the line of what would uh, what would be considered within the limits of what we'd expect. Um, and so that was one of the tasks that I worked on this past, um, this past year, uh, working with that collaboration that Regina mentioned at the beginning called Fast and Fortunate for FRB Follow-Up. We study the host galaxies again, and we, we we're trying to study the cosmic web. That's that all the baryons and matter connecting galaxies really. And so we sort of set out to answer, why does FRB 190608, that's that red point on the graph here, why does it have a slightly higher DM cosmic? Or why, does it, why is it sort of riding the line? Is there anything peculiar happening at that galaxy? Um, and before I answer that, I just want to talk a little bit more about F4, real quick brief aside, um, give you a break. Um, here are the amazing, wonderful people that I get to work with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you can see on the, on the little inset of text there, they're all over the country and all over the world, really. Here at the MMA, in uh, New York, and uh, Northwestern, Santa Cruz, uh, Chile, and um, Iceland, and South Africa. It's, it's a really amazing collaboration. And you might notice one, people, one person that looks really familiar. That's the person next to me on the, on the left here. That's Alex Mannings. 
Alex was in my RU group um, two years ago. And it's, it's just really cool to be able to work with her again. Um, definitely one of the highlights of this past year for me. Um, yeah. And Andrea here on the, on the right most on the bottom, Andrea is the RU intern that we're working with this summer um, on her own research to study similar to what I'm doing, host galaxies of faster universe. And so I'm really excited to work with her. Um, yeah. So thinking back, what's happening with FRB 190608? That's really peculiar. Um, turns out it occurred also in a spiral arm um, of, a, of a massive galaxy. A spiral arm galaxy is similar to our own galaxy, remember. This is different than the other one that was mentioned, but um, it was really exciting because we also sort of discovered a spiral galaxy, a, a host galaxy for a fast radio burst um, very recently. The image that's shown here is from the Hubble Space Telescope, um, the wonderful instrument that's still kicking up in space um, after decades of work for us here in astronomy. This, is image, this image is made from light in the ultraviolet. So I've covered a lot of wavelengths in this talk tonight. I've talked about radio, which is um, the longest wavelength in the shortest frequency light. We can't see that. Microwaves. Um, I haven't mentioned the infrared, but that's where humans glow. If you had a, you ever seen those movies with spies um, that was looking at people uh, through through um, through walls and stuff, and that's because humans radi radiate in the infrared, and so night vision and things like that operate that way. There's visible light, and I also use visible light to study this galaxy. Um, ultraviolet light, um, you want to avoid that, especially this summer if you're in the sun here on Nantucket or elsewhere, put on sunscreen. Um, UV light is sort of harmful to humans. Um, X-ray light, even more harmful. But this is UV light coming from this galaxy, and what it's tracing is all the, the, the more dark blue you see, those are really um, either young or really luminous stars, really big, massive stars. Um, so we're tracing that. From all this light, and I also use something called a spectra um, to study this galaxy, we were able to infer that about 25 to 50% of the total dispersion measure was because of the host galaxy. Um, and we think that's partly why that the DM cosmic value was higher is because the estimate that in JP's paper, um, it was just that, it was an estimate. Um, it subtracted the contribution from the host, but in fact, we think that the contribution to the host, the contribution to the dispersion measure from the host galaxy was more than uh, previously thought. And so that's what my work um, set out to do. Um, in a related paper, Sunil Simha, who's a, grad, uh, a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Joe Burchett. This is probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, what they did was they looked at HG 190608 for my data, and they said, okay, Jay estimated this amount um, is from the host galaxy, and they went through a very detailed analysis to see how much, how much dispersion measure is caused by the host, by, by the baryons, the missing baryons, the missing matter between us and the FRB. And what they, what they wanted to do was, what they, they had a really interesting approach. Um, this was Joe Burchett's idea, it, to grow the cosmic web, those missing baryons, as if they were like a mold. And what they did was, they, they looked through a catalog to see, uh, called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They looked at all of the galaxies that are nearby and all the way towards HG 190608, the host galaxy of this fast reader universe. And they made a simulation where all the galaxies are food to grow the mold. And the mold, again, is a cosmic web. Um, and what they were able to do is, using probability, they were able to recreate what the cosmic web would be between us and this galaxy. And that's what's shown here on the left. It's this really beautiful structure. There's a top view at the, um, here, um, and then there's a side view on the bottom. And there's a two couple insets here on the, onto the right of the plot that's showing you how compli complex and really beautiful the structure is just along, excuse me, just towards this one fast radio burst. And what we have now is that we have a foundation for mapping the cosmic web using fast radio bursts. So as we detect more and more fast radio bursts and we identify which host galaxy they're from, we're able to figure out, or at least estimate, how much dispersion is caused by 
the cosmic web and how much dispersion is caused by the host galaxy. And then we're hoping that we'll be able to use these other galaxy surveys to populate and sort of grow the cosmic web as it were, and to, to, to reconstruct the cosmic web with this model. And it's really, really exciting. It's, it's sort of a game changer, I think, for the field. And it was really exciting to watch um, my colleagues work on this. So whew, that's more, more or less my talk. I'm gonna give you a chance to breathe. I'll highlight some of the things that we've talked about today. We have directly observed the hidden matter using fast radio bursts because the dispersion measure, we have more dispersion, the more missing matter there is between us and any given fast radio burst. Our observations, they match the predictions that Planck and WMAP and all the, and the wonderful scientists who worked with quasars way back when predicted. Um, and it is in fact in that hot gas surrounding galaxies and in between galaxies. Um, we're soon gonna be able to detect hundreds, if not thousands of fast radio bursts. And as we, as we do a better job of identifying their, their host galaxies, we'll be able to reconstruct a map of the cosmic web. And you might recall that figure I showed earlier, um, way at the beginning of that simulation that, um, that looked like purple, uh, purple and yellow. We'll soon be able to recreate that um, in, in the coming years. Uh, instead of a simulation, it'll be closer to what is reality here in our local universe. So it's very exciting. Quick summary, one more time. Cosmology predicted that there's gonna be more baryonic matter than we see, that's matter like you and me. Um, we're able to use these fast radio bursts, which are these short, powerful explosions caused by magnetars and likely other extreme objects. We still don't know much about what these fast radio bursts are. The dispersion measure from FRBs allows us to detect hidden matter. And as we detect these more of these FRBs, we'll be able to start mapping the cosmic web. With that, um, thank you all for coming to this great, uh, hopefully it's a great talk. I don't know, I'll start tooting my own horn there. <laughs> but, um, thank you to Regina Jorgensen. Regina has been the most amazing advisor, especially because I've chosen to stay on island the past few months despite uh, COVID. And for a million reasons, she's been incredibly supportive and helpful and really helped me secure, I think, what I want to do in, with, with my life. And I think that's astronomy. Um, the Mariah Mitchell Association, which has been a great, great home for me this past year and then two years ago as well, um, as well as my fellow researchers, Kraft um, and F4. And today, among many days, I'm remembering JP and his incredible contribution to solving this missing baryon problem. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all for attending and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Jay. That was um, truly fantastic. Um, so we will open it up to questions. Um, and let me see. We don't currently have any Q&As in the box. If anybody would like to ask a question, I'd encourage you to either type it into the Q&A or um, if you're able to raise your hand, I can unmute you if you'd like to ask it directly. Uh, we have a question. Um, Daniel's asking, um, would you talk a little bit more about the differences between the repeater FRBs and non-repeating FRBs? Do you believe we simply haven't observed long enough to see some repeat? If they are different sources, why do you think two sources could create such similar outputs? It's a, it's a great question, Daniel. And actually, let me um, back up real quick and see if I can go back to the slides I talked about that. Um, cool. So repeaters, non-repeaters. So this repeater specifically, um, let me start there and say that the reason we were able to detect it is because we found it in archival data and we knew to look for it um, and we got lucky. And now that the surveys are coming online and Chime has detected eight more repeaters, um, we've, we've identified that some are repeaters and some are not. And the reason we're able to say that with, with confidence now is that we should have seen some our FRBs, if they were to repeat, repeat already. Um, specifically because Chime has um, the kind of coverage to say, if they repeat on short time scales, excuse me, let me clarify that. If they repeat on short time scales, we should have detected more repeaters um, already. And I'll also clarify and say that we, we don't think that repeaters and non-repeaters are the same source. 
in fact, that's partly why we think there's different tracks for FRBs. So if they repeat, there might be one sort of phenomena. If they don't repeat, they might be a different phenomenon. Um, and also tackle the repeating question one more, a, a little more, in a little more depth. We aren't sure why some FRBs repeat yet. Um, some of that might be intrinsic to properties of what's happening around a magnetar. This particular FRB, FRB 121102, one of the leading theories is that this magnetar is embedded in a dense nebula of gas. And every once in a while, it has some sort of flaring event, the, the magnetar. And the way that the emission propagates through this nebula is what's causing um, some of the sporadic repetition. Other FRBs, like the, the one that was in the spiral galaxy that Chime detected, that one's really peculiar because it repeats something like every 16 days. Um, it's not perfectly predictable, but it's happened enough that we, we aren't sure what's causing that periodicity in repeating FRBs. I hope I answered some, if not all, of that question. Great. Uh, thanks. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, uh, this next one's a challenging one. Um, Vern is asking, uh, first of all, she says, thank you for such an illuminating talk. Uh, how does your research contribute to correlating quantum physics with practical physics, uh, as in a possible theory of everything? Wow. Um, that's a great question. I, the, some of the fundamental physics that underlie our ability to observe um, fast radio bursts and light in general are absolutely because of quantum physics. Um, how quantum physics uh, resolves with, with, I guess, classical physics, is that the question, Regina, you think? Uh, yes, I think that's how I would interpret it, yeah. Someone, some theorist probably wouldn't be able to answer this question a little bit better than me. Um, I don't think directly there's a way for us to resolve those specifically from fast radio bursts. One contribution is, in fact, that we have detected those baryons and baryons form some of the basis of cosmology, our ideas of cosmology. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say directly that fast radio bursts, to my knowledge, will help contribute to resolving the, the, the theory of everything, as you said. Um, Regina, what do you think? You think? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that unless, um, you know, I mean, we're trying to, to, to come up with a theory of quantum gravity. So to unify gravity with the rest of the forces, that's the real challenge. And there may at some point be a way to probe that using the cosmic web and FRBs. Um, but at this point, I don't, know exactly what that is, but it's an interesting thought for sure. Um, we have another question, Jay. Um, Vladimir actually is asking, uh, you refer to the hidden matter as just hot, but is it to be ionized in order to produce the observed dispersion? Is it possible in principle to see this ionized gas directly? Um, thank you for the question, Vladimir. And I think so hot ionized gas, it can be seen. Um, it's not completely invisible. Uh, in fact, I think Professor Elmer Green, who was on the line, helped, helped uh, identify some emission from really hot gas. It's really challenging because a lot of that emission is at um, shorter, uh, shorter frequencies, higher wavelengths, or longer wavelengths. So uh, actually inverse. Ultraviolet and X-rays is where we would be able to see some of that emission. Um, and that's a real challenge now to catalog um, this missing matter with that technique. There's also something called the sunayev zeldovich effect, um, which, in which some of this hot gas um, would be detectable through that effect. Um, there's been some mixed success with that um, to find the missing baryons that way. And then the last question, I think, the first question you asked, Vladimir, is, is this gas ionized? And I'd say yes. And in fact, um, it's, it's the fact that there, this gas is ionized that uh, allows us to pro, that makes them more susceptible to increasing dispersion measure um, as light travels through it. Um, so the fact that they, this, this gas is really ionized is what's allowing for the dispersion measure and us to measure the, um, the effect um, 
what makes it possible. Great, thank you. Um, we have maybe time for if anybody has a follow up additional question. Um, that's all the ones we've had in the box so far, or if anybody wants to raise their hand, feel free. Um, I will throw in a question of my own here. Um, oh, wait, we have one more. Oh, Vladimir says, thank you. A great talk. So, um, and I'll throw in my own question here, which is, Jay, as I kind of mentioned in the introduction, um, I'm very sad you'll be leaving us soon um, in a couple of months. However, I'm super excited to, to stay tuned to you know, your next adventure. And would you um, care to, to fill people in on maybe what you might be studying um, or might be focusing your PhD studies on? And I, I know that, that you haven't decided that for sure, and that can certainly change, but are there some things that you're sort of considering um, of studying next? Yeah, actually, so what's interesting is I came to this project probably because I like galaxies and any of the work we would be doing is galaxies. Um, but I hadn't had much experience with galaxies. I was really excited um, with my thesis and the research I did at the RU about planets and protoplanetary disks, and I still am. Um, but now galaxies are also sort of really interesting to me again. Um, so I'm caught between these two very different, um, two very different uh, phenomena that I wanna study. And I'm lucky that at Boulder, I think there are, there's a person, Dr. McGregor actually, who spoke last week, I would definitely want to work with. And there's also someone named Jeremy Darling at, um, at Boulder who studies galaxies and the intergalactic medium, um, the cosmic web in a way um, at Boulder. So one of those two things is I think where I might end up. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Um, uh, Verna's asking, when's your next talk? This was great. We need to follow your work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it might be, it might not be for a while, uh, but if you missed my pub talk, um, a few months ago, I gave a much more uh, relaxed virtual talk uh, through the Linda Loring Nature Foundation here on Island. And I think that's available on YouTube. Um, so if you YouTube Linda Loring Nature Foundation, you'll be able to find another related talk It'll be very similar to the one that I gave today um, about fast radio bursts. But yeah, maybe I'll post somewhere if I ever get another talk. Thank you, appreciate it. And on that note, also, this talk will actually be posted on YouTube yeah. um, tomorrow or the next day. So in case you've missed some of it or um, you'd like to share it with your friends, uh, we will be posting this talk um, on YouTube as well. Um, so I think with that, it is uh, a little bit past the hour and I don't see any additional um, questions or hands. So I would just like to thank you again, Jay, on behalf of the Mariah Mitchell Association for um, such a wonderful talk and for being such a great um, colleague this last year. And um, it's been super fun to have you here. And um, thank you again for everything. And um, thank you all to everybody who's attending um, for coming. And um, if you're interested, we'll be doing another astronomy talk next Wednesday, um, same time, same place. So hope to see you all there. And thank you again. <laughs>